Back in the olden days, when people were either dumb or too far ahead of their time for their intelligence to be worth anything, two men who would lay the groundwork for math nerds actually doing cool things lived. Both of them discovered the same thing at the same time, entirely independently of each other. Now, in a perfect world, all would be well and good with a chuckle and a what are the odds shared between them. However, this world isn't perfect, as should be apparent. What would happen if one of these two men were, for say, a grade-A chump, while also having powerful connections in the world of higher knowledge? And, more importantly, what if someone were to biasly portray one of the involved parties as a villain, a thief, years after things had gone down? Apparently, the answer is calculus. However, before we get into that whole mess, it's important that we discuss the individuals responsible for that. Those, of course, being Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and Sir Isaac Newton. Getting into Leibniz first, he was born July 1st, 1646, in our modern calendar, and the 21st of June in the old-style calendar they were using when he was born. His father died when he was six, which led to him getting his father's library at the age of seven, which then led to him learning Latin. He enrolled in the same university as his father at the age of 14 and got his master's degree in philosophy in slightly less than three years. Then, after not being allowed to get his doctorate in law due to his age, he left the university and got his doctorate at a different university, the University of Altdorf, in 1666. Now, Leibniz loved to fake it till you make it, whether that be a good or bad thing. He often referred to himself as Gottfried von Leibniz, with von used to denote nobility. He was not nobility. The first job he got was as a secretary, and he did not know how to be a secretary. Then he did a favor for real nobility, which got him a job he knew how to do, and lots of promotion. Shortly after, he wrote a paper under a Polish pseudonym on how a German man should get the Polish crown, because at that time, German-speaking Europe was downtrodden, to say the least. Something else that Leibniz did to fix that was a proposal that France take Egypt as to allow them to later take the East Indies. In exchange for being allowed passage to do that, France would leave Germany and the Netherlands alone. The elector, while wary, were in support, but the Franco-Dutch War put that to rest. Later, though, Napoleon performed a version of Leibniz's plan albeit unsuccessfully and unwittingly. In 1972, Leibniz met Christian Huygens, realized his mathematical knowledge wasn't up to par, and began studying math, discovering calculus in the process. During his studies, he also became lifelong friends with the mathematician Ehrenfried Walter von Schuringhaus. From here on, you'll notice that most of the people that Leibniz becomes friends with throughout his life end up becoming lifelong friends. This is because he wasn't a chump. In 1673, Leibniz went to London and presented his basic calculator to the Royal Society. They were basically a group recognizing scientists and people of high intelligence at the time, and immediately became an external member. All was well, and then both of his patrons died. He then returned to Paris with no job. In order to cure this whole joblessness problem, he did get a job in Hanover. However, he wanted to stay in Paris as it was the intellectual center of the world in his mind, so he dragged his feet the entire way, making stops in London. While in London, Newton accused him of stealing calculus, but we'll get to that later. After arriving in Hanover, he befriended the Electress Sophia of Hanover, her daughter, the Queen of Prussia, and Caroline of Ansbach, the consort of Sophia's daughter, who later became the wife of George II. Aside from making dramatic advancements in many fields and building his pile of pals, Leibniz had a job. While working at his job, he was commissioned to make a family history of the Brunswick family by Ernest August. This was a mistake. All that was wanted of him was a cheap and quick book to be pumped out in two or three years. Leibniz spent three or four years gathering information. While part of the reason it took so long was that he was working on other projects, it was mostly due to the fact that he refused to make a quick and cheap book. In the 19th century, the work he had done on the book was collected, and it managed to fill three volumes. 
In 1714, George I became the king of Great Britain through the 1701 Act of Settlement, which Leibniz helped to bring to fruition. However, as he hadn't finished his Brunswick family history, and it would be insulting to Newton, who was embroiled on the calculus debate at the time, Newton having many powerful connections to high society at the time, he was not allowed to attend the celebration. Then, in 1714, his close friend, Dowager Electra Sophia, died. And the next tragic event in Leibniz's life, Leibniz died. No people of high importance, excluding his secretary, attended his funeral, including George I, who was near Hanover at the time. He was a member of both the Royal Society and the Berlin Academy of Sciences, but neither honored his death. His grave was unmarked for 50 years. However, he was eulogized at the French Academy of Sciences at the behest of a niece of his dear friend Sophia. Kinda messed up. With Leibniz's life out of the way, we can move on to Newton. Now, people tend to think of Newton as some kind of mature, noble paragon of scientific and mathematical genius. He was not. Three months before he was born, his father died. Then, he was born on January 4th, 1643, in our calendar. It was Christmas Day in their calendar. He was a tiny, premature baby, able to fit inside a quart mug. When he turned three, his mother left him behind to live with his stepfather. He developed mad daddy issues and a strong dislike of his mother. Then, his stepdad died. Apparently, he had threatened to burn his parents' house down at some point because he hated them so much. His mother had tried to make him a farmer, but he hated that profession entirely. Thankfully for him, his old school teacher for when he went to the King's School in Grantham asked his mother to let him re-enroll in the school, and she did. Once returning to school, he became the top student in said school. Apparently, the reason he became the top student in his school was specifically to spite a schoolyard bully. After entering college, Newton would discover the generalized binomial theorem and then develop a mathematical theory that turned into his version of calculus. Then, after he got his bachelor's degree, the college was closed to combat the Great Plague. He wasn't really outstanding during his time at college, but over the time that he wasn't allowed to go, he made great strides in multiple fields. When he returned to school, he was elected as a Fellow of Trinity. Now, usually Fellows of Trinity need to be ordained priests, which was an issue for Newton. Charles II helped him out, though. After graduating, he became a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1672, which will be important for the debate on calculus. Throughout his time after the closure of his college for plague, Newton did lots of work on light and optics. He determined that white light is composed of multiple colored lights by using prisms to split it, and built the first reflecting telescope, which was dramatically better than previous ones that used lenses, as the splitting of colors degraded the quality of the image. Then, someone criticized some of Newton's ideas. Newton left the public discussion. Now, most modern perceptions of light mechanics differ from Newton's ideas due to further understandings on the subject. However, the contributions he made are not to be understated. His demonstration of prisms has led to many great advancements, such as narrow line-width tunable lasers. We use these today in optical communication, like those fancy fiber-optic internet cables nobody can afford, or that port on the back of all the nice electronics you have that you've never bothered to care about enough to Google what it was, and you're not in a high electrostatic environment so you don't actually need to use. It also gave us those sweet puzzles in Portal 2. The next important thing he did, on July 5th, 1687, Principia was published, which contained the three laws of motion, which laid out the classical laws of mechanics, pushing forward the Industrial Revolution, and going basically unimproved for 200 years. Quite the achievement. Later in life, he was given a job as a warden of the Mint, and while his job was supposed to be one where he kicks back, doesn't really do anything, and gets paid, he put a lot of effort into getting counterfeiters hung. In 1703, Newton was made president of the Royal Society. Then, he published someone else's paper ahead of time so that he could publish his own paper, which used some of the information in that paper that he got access to because he was president of the Royal Society. Shortly after that, in 1705, Newton was knighted. It's believed this was not done to recognize his scientific efforts, but as a political play. 
Right near the end of his life, Newton decided to crash at his niece's place. He described himself as her very loving uncle in letters sent to her. I don't know why, but it sounds a little weird, and I don't like it very much. Then, on March 20th, 1727, Newton died. His funeral was attended by a large swath of important people, and he was buried in a cemetery for royals. I'd like to point out the dramatic difference in treatment between Leibniz and Newton, with Leibniz also contributing dramatically to scientific and mathematical knowledge, but getting completely shoved to the side and disregarded. Back on track, after his death, they examined his hair and found that it contained mercury, which might explain some of his more out-there behavior. Newton is, nowadays, quite widely known to have died a virgin. While he was once said to have been engaged, those were definitely not his intention. During his later years, he had a nervous breakdown and sent many angry and paranoid letters to his friends, in one of which he said that his friend endeavored to embroil me with women. And with Newton out of the way, we can move on to the important part, the calculus controversy. This was the actual fight between Leibniz and Newton on who discovered calculus. Leibniz published his work on calculus first, but Newton claimed that Leibniz stole ideas from Newton's unpublished works. Now, there's a lot of dates of things being published and written and such, and the general idea back when it was happening is that Leibniz was a fraud. However, nowadays it's mostly agreed that both men discovered calculus separately around the same time. Leibniz had actually been in similar situations before where he discovered something that had already been discovered shortly beforehand, but he admitted that they had discovered a thing before him after going back to read their book on it. However, he displayed that he had shown nuance that they had failed to and kept his integrity. During the actual calculus debate, everyone went along with Newton's word even though he didn't really provide any proof of what he said other than his word. After his death, his manuscripts proving that he had actually done work on calculus came to light, but that was after the calculus debate by many, many years. Now, I may have set Leibniz out to be a little angel for this entire thing, but that was not actually the case. It's kind of like that old political meme where everyone is lizards at the end. Leibniz was found to have edited and backdated important works he made in other situations, which did not help to improve his argument during the calculus debate. There's also evidence that he could have seen one of Newton's calculus manuscripts, and he was actually in contact with Newton and even collaborated on power form during the time he would have been developing calculus. However, that does not change the fact that his notation was dramatically different from Newton's, and the entire thing was weighed heavily against Leibniz. Heck, Newton was literally the president of the group that decided Newton was correct in this situation. Leibniz wasn't even asked to give his side of the story. However, even with this horrible treatment, Leibniz's ideas prevailed and we use his methods and notations nowadays instead of Newton's. However, the idea that he was beat down so horribly during his life just feels wrong to me, even if he got justice later on. Died.